I still see people coming in. Okay, welcome on the second day of the conference. I hope you had a nice evening reception yesterday. Everybody's fresh, bright, ready for the next three speakers. Uh, I'm the chair of the session. I work at the EGI Foundation as head of the technical services, solutions, and support. And I'm happy to introduce the first speaker, my colleague Sergio, an old, an old colleague and an old member of staff at EGI, who is head of the disco department. <laughs> this doesn't stand for the dancing department, but for the innovation, uh, communication, and what's the third? Was the strategy? Yeah. And today in his keynote talk, he will talk about the service strategy, which is an element of the EGI strategy, and he will brief us about opportunities that are ahead of us and challenges that are ahead of our community in integrating new services, new capabilities into the Federation to respond to the new challenges of advanced computing. So I'm happy to hand the microphone over to Sergio. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's very nice to see you back after so long time. And I see many faces I know, which is nice to see the community is holding and growing. Many new faces. I hope you had the opportunities also to not only reconnect with the, uh, your old friends from colleagues, but also to meet new people at this conference, which is something that is more or less difficult when we are behind Zoom. And in my presentation, I will uh, uh, address the uh, service strategy of the DJI Federation, and mainly I will uh, um, touch two main points. One is to give an overview of how do we structure today the services of the Federation, uh, talk about the two portfolios we have, and what are the recent innovations that have been released over the last year. And then I will move more to the uh, medium-term vision on what are the main priorities for the services looking forward. For those who are more familiar with GI, you know that usually we organize the services in two main portfolios, one which we informally call the internal service portfolio, uh, which are the set of services that are needed to enable the Federation to work. So without those, the Federation wouldn't be able to operate together. So here we refer like services like the uh, monitoring, the accounting portal, AAI, but also some human coordination. And then those services that enable the Federation as a whole, as a united uh, one, to be able to operate and deliver services to researchers in a federated manner. So we had the what informally call the external portfolio, also EGI services for research. What we are recently doing is to work to a uh, um, new layer of the portfolio. We want to add a third layer, which are the services from the community. I will uh, explain you in a bit about what we mean here. So I will go one by one, just to give you a quick overview. So the services for the Federation are owned by the Foundation but are delivered also in collaboration with some of our participants who especially focus on delivering the technical ones. They are available uh, as a package to those who are part of the Federation, so all the data providers, all the data centers that are part of the Federation can benefit from them and can enable to plug them into the Federation. And uh, uh, we have three main cases of participation into the Federation. Organizations can be represented in the EGI Council. Uh, they pay yearly fee, and maybe they join as a consortium, as a country. They can be commercial providers who are connected via the EGI DIH through an agreement. And also we have organizations outside Europe who are connected via an MOU. And the services are funded mainly through three main sources. One is the um, fees that the council participant pays, the in-kind contributions from the participants who deliver the services, if they get repaid only for part of the cost, and then EC funding for keeping innovation going. What happened in this area over the last uh, year? First of all, okay, here you can see the three categories of the services. 
Uh, on the left hand side, you see more the um, human coordinations in the middle, and on the right, you see more the technical ones. What happened to in the last years? I'll give you just some highlights. For instance, for EGI series monitoring, there's a very nice poster I invite you to visit in the poster area. Uh, the series has added new capabilities to uh, show service trends in terms of usage, status pages, and also capability to define new metrics that are custom for the service and have a nice reporting. In the accounting, for instance, we are um, adding uh, new measurements, new usage records for storage and GPUs, which are very long awaited, and also about the usage of data sets. And in the configuration database, for instance, there will be more support for different IDP, IDP proxies, and also there will be more uh, better support for different backend database management systems. And check-in is going to adopt Keyclock as one of the uh, software components to build the solution. You can know more in a session later today at 2 o'clock, where you will go more into the details of other innovations that have been released. The second uh, service portfolio is the set of services that the Federation delivers to researchers. Here, usually, EGI Foundation is a front-end negotiation, and uh, services can be requested from the community via either EGI channels or via the EOSC marketplace. And here, the funding can be uh, also, there are different ways to fund those services. They can be in-kind contribution from providers. Maybe they get funding from the ministries to build the capacity to serve research, international research. Or there are grants from projects, like in the EGIA's case, where we get, get, get grants from the commission, and we are able to offer capa committed capacity to researchers, or they can be charging to users. And here, uh, we have six main categories of those services. Two are in the area of the computing, like the traditional cloud compute, hybrid compute, and then we have a workload manager to manage workload, uh, computing workload across a distributed infrastructure. In the storage and data, we have the data hub to connect data sources and create a virtual space for data for easier processing. We have data transfer. And then we, in the security, we have check-in, and then we have the training services with a uh, very successful service, FITSM training. And the, in the applications, we have the notebooks, EGI notebooks. What are the innovations we have produced over the last year? Here, we'll show you in different ways. Here, you see the different stages of the life cycles of services in terms of maturity. And we have three new services that uh, have been added from the discovery phase to alpha. One is the data orchestrator. Then we have Replay, which is a binder-based software um, service, which is basically the capability to reproduce Jupyter Notebooks. And then also we have the Infrastructure Manager. Then we have a service called Software Distribution, which is based on uh, CERN uh, CFMFS, to distribute software across the infrastructure which is moving to beta, and then we have a workload manager who is based on the direct technology who is finally in production. It was production from the technical viewpoint for a long time, just missed some agreements to be finalized. Now I move to the third um, portfolio that we want to introduce. So this does not exist yet. It's in the making, and the idea is that we have many uh, communities who build services on top of EGI. And they get support, and they want to reach out more users, more, uh, they want to expand the usage of the, those services. And uh, uh, we understand that they would benefit from EGI, not only as a supply side, expert and technology partners, but also as a promotion channel. So the idea, what they're working on, is to create this catalog 
of services from the community. So the communities retain their own brand. And uh, they can use this catalog to promote the services from, for research through EGI. They, we have been thinking about what are the requirements to join this uh, catalog. Of course, it will not be open to everybody. Otherwise, we don't want to replicate what YOSC is doing. The idea is that, that there should be uh, a connection with EGI, first of all. So they need to build on top of EGI. They need to comply with EGI policies. They need to have a formal agreement. And then they will need maybe to choose a type of engagement. For instance, OK, they want to use EGI only as a promotion channel. They want to use EGI only to support also the integration. Or even as a front-end negotiation. So we would do basically the interface, initial interface with the users, uh, and bring them to their services. So the idea is to finalize this concept, this new layer, by the end of the year, and then to update our internal processes and agreements and have it ready at the beginning of next year for onboarding the first services. We will start with those that are part of the GIAs as a sustainability path and continuity path to stay part of the GI Federation. And then we'll be open to more uh, communities. Now we'll move to the second part of the presentation, which is more about what are the uh, main shifts or priorities we are focusing on evolving our service strategy. We have a three-year service strategy, which is connected to the EGI Federation five-year service strategy. So the overall service strategy is more wider. It looks like the Federation as a whole, in terms from the technical and organizational viewpoint. And the service strategy just looks about what are the priorities for the services. You find, by the way, this brochure is also printed in the lobby. And uh, first of all, okay, we have a small update on the target groups. We are this team in three main areas, with the research, of course, being the primary one, especially international research. Also, we have the private sector. And the third one, we have added public authorities, because we see an emerging need from public institutions to collaborate with infrastructures as such as EGI to uh, develop more uh, advanced capabilities to analyze data that lead to policy decisions. And here, for instance, we are involved in a couple of projects that are also represented uh, in the conference. Here, there are main, uh, the priorities are five. They are in five main areas. One is the computer continuum, data lakes and repositories, scientific tools and data analytics, then with professional support and uh, consultancy, and last one on sensitive data processing. I will go through each of them, telling also what we are doing. So in the first one uh, is the federated data co uh, compute continuum uh, is about the goal is to provide researchers with the capability to analyze uh, and use a different type of computing infrastructure from age, cloud, HTC, and HPC in a uh, seamless way. EGI, as a tradition, is in the, our DNA to uh, federate computing capabilities and yes, to continue on this journey and to include also HPC and the age and also to be able more to generate that, um, also to be able to easily analyze data where data is generated in a seamless way. And this would allow uh, the users who need to run complex workflows that need different types of architecture, or computing architectures, to do, use them in a uh, easier way. And here we are, uh, uh, for instance, for the HPC integration, we are uh, having uh, an important activity in the context of the EGIS project. And we have four use cases where uh, HPC resources are integrated with EGI. And also, we are working on a service called uh, EGI Accelerator Cloud that would integrate Cloud AI, AI, AIS and HPC. If you want to know more about this, there are two opportunities today. 
uh, one is the overview of the successes of the EGIAs, which will be uh, in the session after the plenary. And, uh, and then also there is a dedicated session on HPC in the afternoon at 2 o'clock, from 2 to 3. So you can see more here. Another activity is that we uh, proposed and got approved the working group in the context of the EOSC future called Compute Continuum Working Group. And here is to define the resources, resource schema for describing compute resources as part, as an asset for the uh, EOSC resource catalog. And here the activities are uh, ongoing and there is a public information page. If you are interested in to this activity, you can go browse the page and um, participate if you are interested in that topic. The second priority is connected to the uh, observation that okay, the data sources from different communities are growing. There are many initiatives, both at the national level and community level, to build uh, data repositories or data lakes, federated data lakes. And the goal of EGI here is to connect with those data sources and make it easy to analyze them through the EGI infrastructure. So um, here we are, the goal is to um, also think about the presentation yesterday from uh, uh, the check infrastructure, and the idea here is to, yeah, to move more to do this data-centric approach and to make it easier for um, researchers to find and discover the data that are available and to analyze it via EGI. So here the areas of work come more into the data spaces in terms of architecture, interoperability, <coughs> business models, to build the providers with uh, build agreements with data providers and to adapt EGI solutions to connect with the existing or future uh, data lakes and repositories. And here we have two main initiatives that I mentioned here. Some probably just highlights, but there's more going on. One is part of the HEU Apps for Data project who will have a session uh, in the morning as well. And this is a project where we are involved, uh, who has the goal to federate uh, data catalogs and assets from different DIHs in Europe and other initiatives. And here also we are conducting a pilot to use the Data Hub with the IDS connector for exploring this uh, concept of data sovereignty and interoperability. The second one is a great project. This project will kick off this month, actually it's tomorrow, the kickoff session. And this is a project connected to a Green Deal uh, priority from the Commission. The idea is to develop a minimum, minimum viable product for a Green Deal data space and to, the, uh, to develop a technical architecture and also to define a roadmap for full implementation. It will be a multi-year roadmap for a few years. And as also other priorities like investigating the governance of this data space and develop a community of practice for participants. So this project will uh, is kicking off this month, as I mentioned, and there's a session tomorrow morning. But unfortunately, it's closed only to participants. Uh, so you need to wait. If you're not part of the project, you need to wait for the first results to know more. And the priority number three is about, uh, Tizian yesterday was mentioning about moving up to the stack for the EGI Federation. And the year is about to enrich the number of applications, scientific tools that are available to researchers that can be easily deployed on the infrastructure. And here we want to reach the number of, uh, of those applications that are easy integrated with EGI tools, like EGI notebooks, for instance, and, uh, and have those applications readily available and discoverable by researchers. And uh, here also this concept of the community portfolio that I mentioned before will play an important role to capture them and make them uh, available. 
And here we have three main initiatives I would like to mention or highlight. One is the EGIA, so one side is oh, the project serving us to build this community layer. And also, as it has already a number of services, which are more on the application level, we will uh, integrate them. And then we have two flagship projects that one kicked off on Monday, the other one will be Friday. And so Imagine will uh, be launched on Friday, uh, formally. There is a session tomorrow. Uh, it's a public session, informative session, if you want to know more. The Imagine project is more about developing AI machine learning tools for image analysis in the aquatic sciences, while the Intertwin is more about providing uh, tools for um, run complex application in the domain of digital twins. And also there, there is a component about managing AI workflows and models. And uh, the priority number four is to improve what we already do. So in EGI is not only providing technical services, but also consultants and expertise. If you go on the, our service catalog, it looks like more about more technical solutions available, but this idea of supporting consultancy doesn't emerge very um, strongly, although it's an important component. So in a way, we want to increase the way we promote these capabilities from EGI on one side, so there's an improvement of the increased awareness of the support on the consultancy and expertise that we provide. On the other side, we want to expand on the um, support side, the network of supporters within the community. So we want to grow the number of technical support people committed from the various EGI Federation members and to uh, increase this capability as it will be important for the type of uh, users we have. So in this area, we mentioned two main uh, roles. One, for instance, uh, in EGI A's, we introduced this concept of Shepard, which probably, if you're familiar with the private sector, there's a popular role now called in companies called the Customer Success Manager. Something like that, probably a repurpose in the research domain. And here, the Shepard is the person that is in charge from the provider side to follow the principal investigator, understand the requirements, have a dialogue with the providers to have the capacity location, maintain the entry into the customer relationship database, monitor progress in the engagement with the GI, and at the end, to write case studies. We also have a handbook defining this profile, and also we have actually uh, people working and playing this role in the context of the GIS project. This is something like we want to maintain and evolve as part of the EGI way of engaging with user communities. The other one is the launch of the Digital Innovation Hub from EGI, which is more the consultancy and support channel for private sector to stimulate innovation between private companies, especially those who are more resource limited or resource bound, and the public funded infrastructures. And uh, here there was a session yesterday, so if you miss it, you can go and check the material when it will be available. Now we're moving to the last priority. Uh, this is not commitment to build production services yet. It's more an investigation of and uh, piloting of services to process sensitive data. And uh, we see a growing number of needs from uh, users to analyze sensitive data. This is challenging when you want to do on a shared infrastructure, so they need a high level of uh, warranties that the data will be treated in a <coughs> way that is compliant with the policies. So here we need to do on one side that we are conducting um, understanding what are the needs for cross-border processing of sensitive data, what are the challenges, and what are the solutions that are available yet uh, there on the market that we could use to pilot 
uh, this kind of services. We are involved in two initiatives that are connected to this domain. One is the Healthy Cloud project. That is, that is more a strategic project with the goal to define a strategic agenda for uh, a European Health Research Innovation Cloud. And here we contributed analysis of the uh, computer landscape uh, infrastructure for health data space in Europe. Then we have the LEED project, uh, where uh, here there is more um, practical piloting of um, trusted compute platform using EGI services in the domain of sensitive data. And here also there is a session, actually there was a session yesterday, so if you are interested you can uh, go and check the material with more information about these topics. So in summary what we've seen, that we've seen the way EGI organizes its own services in this two portfolio with the third one emerging. We have seen also what were the innovations uh, that were released over the last year. And we have seen also the EGI uh, main priorities to evolve the service strategy for the next three years. And also what are the projects that are bringing the energy to make those priorities become uh, results that everybody can use. So that's my last slide, so I welcome any questions now. Thank you. Question. Yeah, only question. Uh, I would like to see also here in this kind of event also some representative of companies, you know, so that they should see what are these ambitious and what are the goals here. So I don't know if somebody is here from companies. From private companies, you mean? Private, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I yesterday I, I said that I'm a very in touch with companies and very important. There are coming requirements and also demand from these companies. I think it is important also to, to be here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in general, attracting private companies at the DJI conference, because we work with companies who have, res uh, have limited in resources and funding. And at the moment, the engagement we have is not supported through grants. So the more challenge to join our events. In the future, maybe we hope we can support them also to join our events. Yeah. But in the past, we managed to have some session, but usually maybe we could think about having some EGI and private sector days, focus days, more than embedding them in a wider conference where the focus is mainly the community as a whole. So like other organizations, they have like industry days or maybe the idea could, do, could be to have a focused event and uh, they could help them join in an easy way, a more focused way. So I have a comment about the, one of the strategies which is about the integration of HPC extending the ISRP computing and cloud uh, federation and perhaps this is a question more for Gergay, I don't know, but my question is uh, because tomorrow we are going to discuss in the opening plenary how infrastructures uh, will uh, coordinate and cooperate to improve the support to scientific communities, we will have uh, not only UDAT, OpenAir, GEAN, um, and um, the infrastructures that have been already operating in the last 10 years or more years, but also Aero HPC. So can you say a bit more about um, how EGIA is, is uh, supporting uh, this cooperation, um, if there are already some results and how this could be expanded in the future? EGIS is the project that supports the compute platform for also the European Open Science Cloud. So it's, I think, a very important uh, topic uh, for, for this strategic item. Can you brief us on that? Yeah, so very briefly, because I don't want to run ahead of us. The next session will be about EGIS, and from 2 o'clock we have a session dedicated for the HPC integration. <laughs> so this is just the highlight, right? Um, so indeed, we, we integrated 
HPC systems based on four scientific pilots and based on four HPC sites from EGI member organizations. And what the integration means is basically using the same federation layer, federation services that we use for HTC and cloud for the HPC world. And what I think the, the big message here and the value why we are doing this, given praise and your HPC and all of those, those initiatives existing, we are doing this because we, what we observe in EGIA is, is the, really the added value of academic e-infrastructures is this human support layer. And if we can bring that support layer on top of all these different types of infrastructures, that's a huge bonus instead of having separate support for Prey, separate support for Euro HPC, separate for cloud, separate for whatever. So with this integration of the federation layer, we can pull together also the human support layer, adding a bonus for the users. So instead of they are driving into the wrong side of the landscape, they are just have a one-stop shop for navigation. And we see that beneficial for many entities, small projects, groups, even multi-year projects don't have the expertise to choose the right entity on the European landscape. So I think it's an enormous step forward for defragmenting the landscape. So I think that's, that's the main message, that's the value. Uh, and concerning the technical details and, and the impact so far, come to the session at two o'clock, that's the most important. Yeah, and I see Yannick wants to respond to this topic. And, and I don't think we have time for more uh, questions after this talk. Thank you. It's not a response to that. It's just a, a question about the third portfolio that you want to develop. Uh, you said that this is for community services. Uh, so uh, I work for Operas, uh, a research infrastructure in the SSH area. So we already have our uh, direct selling channel. Uh, we have the SSH marketplace. We have the EOSC marketplace. So what is the added value or what will be the unique selling point for uh, joining the EGI marketplace? And, and you said that you want EGI to be the, the front end, for example, for negotiation, which means that we need to, to delegate you some uh, contractual capacity and things. So what will be uh, the, the argument for us to, to join? Yeah. So that, uh, <clears throat> so first of all about the EGI's uh, front-end negotiation that would be one option. There were three options that we are thinking. One, just EGI as a promotion channel. So it's more, let's say, to get more visibility through the EGI communication channels. The second one is to, for instance, provide support, for instance, if the community relies on some EGI services or they want some service to be operated by EGI. For instance, they have a scientific gateway. They say, OK, that's my technology, my know-how into this service. I don't want to bother about operating it. Can you do it for me? That would be one type of engagement. And the third one, as you mentioned, could be this, if they want us that we deal with the community. So these are options, and the idea is that uh, the added values that they can delegate uh, to EGI if they don't want to uh, deal with these kind of functions. In your case, where you have a more mature community, where you have your own channels, Probably you'll be happy just with the, with the promotion, so you don't need anything else. And, uh, and then it will be up to the community to decide if they want to join. So they have this, depending on their needs, they can have different levels of engagements, and, uh, and we see how they will respond. In general, we identify that there are some communities that will benefit from it. So uh, we don't want to replicate what is there, just offering new capabilities and to do that work in collaboration with EGI. Thanks. Thank you. And thank you, Sergio, for the talk. And I would like to immediately invite our next speaker, or introduce her, Jana Klanova, from the IRINA Research Infrastructure, I hope I pronounced it correctly, which is a new infrastructure on the SRE roadmap focused on human exposome research. And Irina is the coordinator of that infrastructure, also professor on environmental chemistry and the director of the RECOTOX, an independent department of the Masaryk University focused on research in environmental and health sciences. Jana has a vast experience in research focused on impact on toxic substances on the environment, products, and food. Uh, she combines 
different types of data during her work from long-term environmental monitoring, human biomonitoring, laboratory experiments, and mathematical models. So we are looking forward to the, to the challenges you will brief us about. She published over 180 scientific articles with more than 4,000 citations. And also she acts as expert in different policy boards, such as the United Nations Environment Program, the WHO monitoring programs, and she leads a group on Earth observation to enhance the use of interdisciplinary data. So without further delay, I pass the microphone. Well, thank you very much, and thank you for inviting me here, although I feel a bit alien to this audience because my background, as you've heard, is in environmental health sciences. So I'm here today to tell you something about AREEN Research Infrastructure, which is a new project recently added to the S3 roadmap in 2021. Uh, where did it come from? Uh, we were trying to address the gap that was identified in 2018 as free roadmap, saying that we needed the infrastructure that would facilitate health and well-being at all stages of the development. It means looking into various factors that can affect the development of the human health and diseases, including not only environment, but also economic, social, psychological factors. Behind that, uh, there is a keyword of the human exposome, which is the, uh, the, the keyword in the environmental health sciences that is flowing around in the last 10 years. Exposome means the universe of all factors that are behind the development of the human health. I should say non-genetic factors. So if you look at the picture at the right side of this slide, it was believed 20, 25 years ago that genome is the key, that once we read the human genome, we would know everything needed for the precise or precision medicine, that genome translates directly into the phenotype. It is known now that there are plenty other factors, and that the genome only is responsible for between 20 and 80 percent of the development of your human health, while the psychological, social, environmental, and other factors that we all together call exposome are responsible for the rest. So it was generally accepted that functional genomic means translation from the genome to transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, metagenome, and that goes to the specific phenome of the person. And we should do the same thing on the exposome side, because the exposome factors can affect the genome, transcriptome, proteome, metabolome, microbiome, whatever. So it is in reality the triangle now between exposome, genome, and the phenome. If you look at the uh, picture to the left, it is, explains that we have to think about the external exposome and internal exposome. External exposome being the external environment. It means contamination of your food and water and uh, air being indoor and outdoor air. Uh, the climate change and all types of urban stressors, while internal exposome is more about your body. So how these factors translate into the processes of your internal body. So for chemical exposures, exposures to the toxic compounds, uh, they are correlated. You know, if you live in the contaminated environment, you most probably can find the heavy metals or toxic compounds also in the body fluids of your, your body. But the advantage of uh, the internal exposome is that you can also track the effects, measuring various biochemical molecular markers. You can also see what all those factors are doing in your body or to your body. So we have to integrate the external part and the internal part, and those two approaches are interlinked. You know, if you assess only the external part, you have a good information where the stressors are coming from, but you can only model 
what they will do to your body. If you measure the internal exposome, you have the good picture of what is happening in your body, but you can only guess whether the certain chemicals are coming from food or water or air or consumer products. So uh, this is even more complicated because this is ongoing process from the birth of the child or even before the birth during the prenatal life until the death of the person and it's really tricky to assess it. So when we started building the research infrastructure on human exposome it was clear that in the heart of it must be the laboratory capacity but it must be the laboratory capacity that can handle internal and external exposome measuring various uh, uh, compounds in the body, but also environmental matrices, indoor environment, building environment, consumer products and such. And it's not enough to assess uh, the chemical exposures, but we also need to assess various markers. Markers at the genomic, epigenetic level, proteomic, metabolic, uh, metagenomics, and others. And it's not enough to work with the targeted analysis, because we need to screen for you know, the new chemicals, to explore new biomarkers. So we have to combine the targeted and non-target uh, analysis. And then, to address the external and internal uh, exposome, we need to team up with other existing infrastructures because we don't want to replicate what was already done in other research infrastructures. Because talking about environmental factors, it's not only about chemical exposures, but also the climate change, for example. So the infrastructures like ECTRIS or ICOS can significantly contribute, but it also means that we must be able to merge data coming from various domains and various infrastructures. The same applies for the human health, because there are existing infrastructures like BBMRI, existing biobanks or human cohorts, but there are also the health registers, clinical studies that are usually not willing or able to make their data so easily available. So that's the left side of the picture. But then we are coming to the data integration. So big enough challenge is the QAQC and merging the data coming from different laboratories, even if you stay in the same domain. But then we also need to merge the data coming from different domains and build sufficient capacity. And of course, this is not about moving data around, but making them accessible, accessible in line with the EOS and fair data principles. And the only way how we can do that is the federated analysis. What? Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, but there are also various ways how we will use data in the future because they have a potential to be used for development of the new biomarkers in the medicine. But also these data are very important for uh, the policy making because we are exploring a lot of new chemicals that can be potentially harmful in the future. So the ways how we can use the data is for epidemiology, for mechanistic toxicology, for scientific and policy making reasons. So it is also important to think about how the data will be presented and shown and communicating to the general public and the scientists. So it was said already that uh, the new Aryan infrastructure is coordinated by Masaryk University in Brno, the Recetox Center, which is the Center for Environmental Health Sciences. And the advantage of Recetox and the reason why we are coordinating this new infrastructure is that Recetox research infrastructure has been on the Czech national roadmap already since 2012. So we have a decade of experience with building of this multidisciplinary research infrastructure. The oldest part of the Recetox RI are accredited laboratories that were originally built as the accredited trace analytical laboratories. But I've just said that that will not be enough. It needs to be complemented uh, with uh, the facilities for non-target analysis, for metagenome, epigenome, proteome, metabolome, and such. 
the second core facility where uh, monitoring networks, because already more than 10 years ago, we got involved with the United Nations Environment Program and then the global conventions that are focused on protection of human health from uh, the toxic compounds in the environment, like Stockholm Convention or Minamata Convention. So in order to, do, to support such a global effort, you really need to invest a lot into large scales air or water monitoring networks, but also human biomonitoring networks. And then you also need to build sufficient uh, data capacities. So then the third element of our research infrastructure were information platforms. And because we were working a lot with the policymakers, we had to invest not only into building the databases, but also the presentation tools and you know the demonstrations and models that would show why the data are useful and allow the policymakers to evaluate the current situation and future trends. And then the newest uh, core facility of the research infrastructure are population studies. Because if you want to link external and internal exposome, environment and health, you also need to work with the longitudinal population studies. And this is, of course, most complicated and most expensive too. To do this investment, we were lucky to use various means of uh, the widening instrument. For those who are not familiar with that, widening is a special instrument of Horizon 2020, but also now Horizon Europe. Uh, that is supposed to support development of excellent centers by collaboration between new member states and advanced uh, the centers in the advanced countries. And in 2019, we were able to get three projects from widening, you know, the, the teaming, twinning and era chair project that were really used to build the capacity for the research in the area of human exposome. We teamed up with University College London, ETH in Zurich to build sufficient capacity, but also especially for networking at the European level and important part of these projects was building this new European research infrastructure and placed it into the S3 roadmap. Uh, the, the picture representing uh, this new European Centre for Human Exposome Research connects the planet, individual person and the society, because this is what demonstrates how the uh, human exposome has to be assessed. You know, there is an impact of the society on the environment, but also directly on the human being, but then also uh, the affected environment affects both the human society and the human individual. Uh, the idea was not only to build the research, but also the education, because you really need to raise the new generation of the scientists that is educated in multiple disciplines, including IT and data handling, and also to build the research infrastructure, but also the communication platforms, as I explained before. Uh, we ended up developing something we called Partnership for the Healthy Future, or Brno Living Lab, which is actually the partnership of not only research institutions at the regional level, but also the regional companies, private institutions, city of Brno regional authorities, and this was translated also in the policymaking documents, because uh, the Brno Living Lab is currently one of the important goals of the regional innovation strategy of South Moravia, but also the top flagship project of Brno strategy 2030. But the same thing has to happen at the European level. Of course, the area of human exposome and uh, the env linking environment and health has been around for a decade and there were multiple European, big European projects addressing this issue. But the problem is in fragmentation and also the time limits, because all those consortia have been working together for four or five years, reinventing wheels as soon as the project was over, all the outcomes were lost. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to mention two projects, actually two co-funds financed from Horizon 2020. One of them is Human Biomonitoring for Europe, which was the European joint project that really wanted to build a background for human biomonitoring in Europe. It was a large consortia of almost 100 partners from almost all countries with the initial investment of 75 million euros. And it had way too many work packages probably, looking into harmonizing the laboratory capacities and data capacities and adverse outcome pathways and human cohorts and too many things. And it was very clear during this project that what we are missing is this infrastructure because we were starting from scratch, trying to do some harmonization, but there was not clear what will happen after the end of the project. The similar project was ERA Planet, which was the European ERANet focused on strengthening the role of Europe in uh, the GEO, the group of Earth observation, and demonstrating how we can bring together different environmental data, make them more visible and connect them from uh, with the satellite data. There are also other existing projects still ongoing, financed from Horizon 2020, like Urion cluster of eight projects looking into the uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals, or EHAN network, which is the European network of nine different projects focused on building the toolbox for assessment of human exposome. But I would like to mention the HERA project, because HERA was supposed to set up the research priorities of Europe in the area of environment and health. And uh, of course, HERA was based on the current uh, scientific challenges and uh, the societal needs of Europe based on the Green Deal. Because if you look at the different chapters of the Green Deal, it's not only about the climate change, but it's about zero pollution, urbanization, you know, the uh, combating cancer and other diseases by improving our environment. And for that, we definitely need the information base and we need to somehow align all the information sources that we currently have. So one of important goals of HERA, one of the eight goals actually, was building the research infrastructures, interdisciplinary research infrastructures, connecting the environmental and health domains. And this is exactly what uh, AIRIN infrastructure is doing. And it brings together, you know, the societal needs given by uh, Green, uh, Green Deal and other European policy documents and the societal challenge of research on human exposome. So as I said, AIRIN was placed in the S3 roadmap in the fall of 2021. And if you look at these green and orange circles, it demonstrates how interdisciplinary it really is. Because these pictures are taken from the landscape analysis from 2021 roadmap, showing that the problem of chemical exposures is really cross-cutting. It's relevant for all the environmental domains, be it oceans or land or food or whatever, but it is also very relevant for all the health domains. You know that one of the missions of Horizon Europe is the cancer, and if you look into the European white paper on cancer, it has a chapter on the human exposome, recognizing that we need to invest not only in the diagnostics and treatment of the cancer, but especially the prevention. And in prevention, we really need to more know more about you know the the exposure factors or all the risk factors behind development of the disease in parallel with this europe is also opening the new partnerships and the first horizon europe partnership that was kicked out earlier this year is park which is the european partnership on chemical exposures uh, it's kind of follow-up of the Human Biomonitoring for Europe joint project. Even It's even bigger with the investment, bigger than 
uh, 200 million euros and more than 150 partners. But the major difference is that in this partnership, one third is already dedicated to the research infrastructures, building the laboratory, cohort infrastructures, but also data infrastructures, and aligning them with fair data principles, EOSC, <laughs> consortia, and all of this. So for us, the PARC partnership is really a tool and financial source to move towards more harmonized European infrastructure for environmental health research. If you would like to know more about AIRIN and our activities, one of the chances is the ICRI conference being held in Brno in three weeks or so. So if you are coming there, you may visit one of the side events that we are organizing on Tuesday, 18th of October, there will be meeting of AIRIN with other infrastructures that are relevant for human exposome research, discussing the overlaps and harmonization of our activities across the environmental and health domains. And then on Wednesday 19th in the evening, we organize the grand opening of the Celspac Biobank because, you know, the collecting and biobanking uh, the samples is one of the important elements of uh, the AIRIN field. So this is about uh, ICRI. That would be an opportunity to visit the city of Brno, which is the city of history, culture, architecture, and science. And this year, we celebrate 200th anniversary of the birth of Gregor Mendel, the father of the genetics. And we will try to convince you that we carry on, that we not only continue with the genetic research, but Brno is also now center of the exposome research, complementing the second half of the story of human health and life. So thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much for this, thank you very much for this exciting talk. Uh, we will be also with some of the colleagues in Bruno for the ICRI conference. So, and I'm definitely interested in checking out the new biobank. It's a really inspiring uh, presentation of a truly interdisciplinary infrastructure and I was uh, fascinated by the challenge uh, of integrating data from multiple research infrastructures. Um, so how is the problem of data access and integration being uh, handled uh, in Irene? You really have to start from the bottom, so integrate the existing elements. So for example, already during HBM for Europe project, we started building at least the database of European laboratories and trying to get on the top of it and introduce some kind of QAQC system that would enable evaluation of the data coming from such laboratories. That's one element. In uh, EHAN uh, network, they invest a lot into building the infrastructure for human cohorts. Because if we are talking about human cohorts, those are longitudinal studies on human populations, but it could be pregnant women, newborns, parents, adult people, adolescent, aging. You know, we have hundreds of European cohorts, many of them still ongoing, but they were set up for different purposes and most of them were not multidisciplinary. You know, some were environmental, some were social, even linking the social cohorts under share, for example, share uh, research infrastructure with the environmental cohorts or clinical cohorts is a challenge. So in collaboration with BBMRI, the network is trying to build one repository or the library that would be searchable where you can, you know, the step one is really finding those cohorts and finding the, uh, the information about them. The step two is, of course, trying to align their research tools, but that's difficult because if they are longitudinal, they want to continue with the same tools that they originally started. So then the third way forward is really federative analysis. So if each of them uses the same 
uh, demonstration or you know visualization tool showing you know which questions from the questioners or data from the lab mean what this European network that would allow in the future some some type of federative analysis because we are also talking about sensitive personal data that are protected they can only can be assessed under the specific conditions so we first have to handle all those small elements and then work towards the future federative analysis thank you other questions so I'm wondering, so what amount of data is currently available for the next research? For example, for federated learning or this NRA, this AI technologies? Uh, I this. would say the most complicated are data from the human cohorts because, you know, the environmental data uh, about the climate change, about the quality of the atmosphere, they are still quite simple. You know, they, you know, they can be handled in the Excel tables, even though they are large. But for the human cohorts, you have to combine the data from the questioners. Those can be, you know, thousands of questions asked every year to the population of thousands of people in hundreds of cohorts. This needs to be combined with the information about the physical examination, so extended list of different parameters that are being measured. Then the data are brought to the biobanks. And then, you know, whatever you can measure in the biobanks, the exposure and biomarker and genetic and epigenomics. So when we were originally thinking about the design of the support IT infrastructure, you need to have something that can host the data on environmental uh, factors, then data hosting or running the, the human cohorts, because you also need to have some administration system that is really running the, the cohort, sending out the questionnaires, collecting data again. This needs to be linked to the biobanking system, because uh, if we take one sample, we usually end up with something between 50 and 100 aliquots that are brought to the biobank. So you need to really bring, uh, build the, the automated biobanking system for, for handling it. And then data from the or samples from the biobank would go to multiple laboratories. And some of them produce the, the non-target data, which are very big data files that need to be explored with the advanced tools that are not even there sometimes. So we are also working. Now we are investing a lot of time into building the, the data processing pipelines for non-target analysis, and those are the biggest files. And then again, if you want to use the model, pharmacokinetic model, adverse outcome model, you need to link it to external data from toxicology, from risk assessment. So this very diverse data sitting in different databases in very different properties. One, one more question. Hi, <coughs> Mario Reale from Xi'an. Thank you for the wonderful presentation about it. I, will, I was wondering, uh, uh, I mean, related to this last question about the multidisciplinary data spaces, if you are tracking somehow the evolutions coming from the European Commission side on data spaces in particular, because it looks to me that you really need to cross-connect the Green Deal data space and the health data space in general. So I was wondering if you have any plans or specific uh, tasks in this direction, or is it too early, or uh, I don't know. I was curious about that. I know the Commission is working on tenders, uh, middleware, and this sort of things. I think it is crucially important to connect what is happening at the European and at the national level. Because, you know, we have the European strategies, but then we have the data that are being produced at the national level, very often paid from the national resources and they have their national regulations. So the whole EOSC initiative is driven at the European level, but also at the national level. And uh, I've heard in one of the previous presentations that we really need to invest into the human resources. I think this is very important here because 
the people who are working with the data coming from environmental health research, they are usually not experts in you know, data handling, but more and more they need to invest into it and they cannot hope that somebody will serve them automatically. So what we need to do now is to really work together, you know, the communities that are in these health and environmental domains with the experts, with data handling, the research infrastructures that are already providing some tools and really develop the layer of experts that are speaking the same language. Thank you. We are going to shift the focus to the Commission, which was mentioned earlier in the last question, so perfect timing. I would like to invite Christian Cuccinello, a police officer at the Commission, who works in the Open Science Unit of the DG Research and Innovation. He's involved in the implementation of the Horizon Europe co-program partnership on EOSC, and notably he is developing course topics and policies on data, on fair, fairness on services, repositories, and identifiers. Thank you. If you don't mind, I will uh, sit uh, and look at my slides uh, because I have uh, slide back problems, but uh, can, can you pass me the, the remote? Yeah. Thank you. So thanks a lot for uh, having me here and uh, let's start talking about open science and what open science means for the commission. I mean, we, we see that science is in a digital transition today uh, and uh, it's, it is facing uh, systemic challenges, uh, but I mean, is, are we reinventing the way of scientific process in a certain, I mean, to give an answer, a sort of. Uh, digital transformation has raised important issues and uh, we are uh, seeing that this digital transformation is affecting uh, every step of the research process. And uh, this, uh, this concerns a lot policymakers like the European Com uh, Commission that is looking on how to leverage on technologies to stimulate innovation and the effectiveness of research and uh, also to address uh, uh, certain uh, pressing policy challenges. Looking at the ways in which dig digitalization is changing scientific research uh, and at the challenges that arise from the widespread adoption of these uh, new digital tools and practices, we see many uh, facets of digitalization in scientific research. For example, the adoption of digital scientific collaboration and productivity tools throughout the different stages of the process, a new digitally enabled di diffusion of, uh, of, the, of, of the knowledge arising from, uh, from research, the use of advanced data intensive digital tools uh, to gain uh, uh, higher insights and uh, the last presentation showed us uh, how powerful it can be. And the development of uh, digital identifiers uh, and uh, uh, that are uh, really tied to communication of the scientific wor uh, work and uh, uh, collaboration among te teams of science. Uh, there we see also the uh, adoption of digital tools and practices that uh, are unprecedented like uh, big data analytics, internet of things that are facilitating the collection of data and the processing of such data. Uh, so uh, then uh, we see this transformation, but is the system uh, in which it happens, fit for the purpose. And, uh, let's say that uh, uh, the transformation is happening in a system, in a research system that is tied to rules of yesterday and uh, it creates systemic challenges that transcend the main adoption of the new tools and the practices. So as you can see here, uh, I listed uh, a few, few challenges that, let's say, create some uh, difficulties for researchers to, uh, let's say, fully embrace this new uh, digital revolution of science. So it means that uh, uh, we, we need also uh, uh, to affect 
not only the way in which uh, researchers are doing uh, sa the, their scientific work, but also the system in which they, they, are, they are acting. So uh, then, I mean, this presentation focuses on open science and is open science part of the answer providing, yes, I mean, for the commission it is, of course, it is uh, only if it's uh, uh, accompanied by a, a systemic change. So, uh, we, we, uh, open science can bring uh, quality and efficiency of research uh, uh, and innovation system. Uh, can add creativity for, through collaboration, can also bring trust in, uh, in science itself, uh, engaging uh, uh, with society and exposing more in uh, its, its results. So uh, then, of course, uh, the European Commission uh, wants to embrace open science and make it the new normal for, for researchers. And it is a priority for the European Commission and uh, it's, uh, it, it is the standard method of working under the research and innovation funding programs of the Commission uh, because we consider it improving the quality and efficiency and res responsiveness of research. The logic is that when researchers share the knowledge, share the data as early as possible, in the research process, uh, all the relevant actors, uh, and when, when in the research projects, all the relevant actors are included, it helps also the, 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 the knowledge diffusion, and it spreads and enables others to capitalize on research results. When we also do a step forward, and we include industry, public authorities, and citizens, uh, we really create uh, a new layer of creativity and uh, uh, trust in science uh, also increases. Uh, we find the commitment of the Commission uh, towards open science in uh, uh, several communications, such as the, the new uh, European research area that has been also validated by Council conclusions. The Commission supports the implementation of, of key enablers because uh, open science cannot happen without uh, enablers, without bringing these digital tools to, to researchers and without affecting the research systems in Europe. I use the plural because every country has uh, certain peculiarities and we cannot consider a, a single European research system, but a federation. I mean, we, we talked about, you talked about federation in terms of technology, but let's also talk about federation in terms of implementation of policies. And uh, we, uh, in, we tackled these um, enablers through our funding programs on one side and uh, uh, through examples and practices that the Commission pushes for uh, within its program and uh, uh, let's say uh, wanting to lead um, by example. So uh, going uh, into, into more concrete description of this commitment, uh, we we find the European research area, uh, the renewed European research area as the, let's say, umbrella where uh, several changes uh, in, uh, in the research environment in Europe are, are proposed. And those are, uh, as I said before, accepted by the, um, the member states of, of the Union uh, up to the fact that they agreed on a, uh, the, the scale, uh, the time scale of the new era is 2022-2024. Uh, but, I mean, uh, the, the member states agreed on a longer pact for research and innovation in Europe. 
that uh, uh, is not binding, but it sees a set of common new principles and values for research infrastructure, uh, a shared, a shared priorities among member states uh, for, for actions, uh, applying investments uh, and reforms, and uh, uh, stimulating the policy coordination and the monitoring process of, uh, of this, this evolution. We, uh, this pact has been pushed mainly uh, because of uh, challenges that we are facing, notably the COVID-19 platform, uh, the COVID-19 uh, um, uh, pandemic uh, that brought responses, uh, not only in terms of policies, but also in terms of actions. And uh, the COVID-19 platform, for example, is a joint effort that uh, has seen many uh, infra digital infrastructures in Europe sharing data and, uh, uh, let's say, embracing uh, open science in terms of uh, early sharing, in terms of collaboration, in terms of making at disposal of the, the community uh, scientific results. But, uh, I mean, the pact is, uh, let's say, a, a demonstration that also member states want to uh, collaborate, wants to work together with the Commission in the implementation of uh, uh, the ERA priorities, notably for uh, digital infrastructure for science and uh, uh, for open science, we have, uh, let's say, the, the priority one that sees the implementation of EOSC, that's seeing uh, the, the European Open Science Cloud as the main enabler for open science, and uh, uh, the deployment at, uh, of EOSC at three levels, so at European and national and institutional level, with a monitoring of uh, efforts. Uh, that uh, are uh, put in place by this free level of engagement. We have also uh, the, uh, the an attention that uh, uh, the Commission puts on, uh, uh, let's say, integrating not only actions on open science, but looking forward, creating a legislative layer that is more compatible uh, towards science. And uh, we are doing an analysis on, on uh, copyrights uh, uh, and other, other regulatory frameworks to see if they are fit for, uh, for research and uh, uh, to prepare um, also to enable researchers to, to exploit better uh, the, the digital information that they have at their disposal. Uh, here, you, you can see how many uh, digital legislations can impact uh, the, the research project, uh, process. We start from the uh, database directive that's uh, moved towards a uh, few changes to adapt to uh, a, a digital market but focuses mostly on, on the market itself. So uh, we need to find, let's say, the uh, reality, a, a better reality for researchers to, to, to exploit this legislation. And we have uh, the Open Data Directive that we all know, but that has been also affected by the Data Governance Act, the Data Act, the Digital Service Act, and the Digital Market Acts that are made for the uh, single digital market. And uh, uh, let, they do not, let's say, uh, focus really on research. Uh, so there is uh, the need of the uh, legislative uh, interpretation to create the, the right background for, for researchers to uh, be able to navigate in, uh, in these uh, uh, legislative proposals. Of course, the Commission is motivated to eventually integrate uh, and uh, uh, create the room for, uh, for science to better uh, use and to find, um, to avoid biases and to find the way of uh, acting with the uh, uh, right freedom that uh, research needs. 
We have also a, an important uh, uh, action in the era that is uh, the reform of the research assessment. As I said before, the, uh, there are biases in the system, uh, in the research assessment system, because it's a system made for yesterday and not for today. Uh, here uh, we see uh, researchers uh, engaging in new kind of activities, producing new uh, different outputs, not only publications. So how this behavior, uh, open science practices and new behavior of researchers can be uh, taken into account uh, uh, in, in a system where uh, in, in, uh, high impact factor journals are still uh, a dominant element to assess the productivity of a researcher or an institution or a national system. So a systemic change has to be introduced. We are pushing for a coalition that is forming now uh, for uh, reforming the uh, research assessment and uh, to offer let's say, a new framework to be adopted by the different countries to take into account mostly open science practices and these new kind of outputs and new kind of contribution that researchers can bring uh, in, uh, in the research activities uh, along the life cycle of, uh, of, of, of the research work. So uh, these are the elements that we tackle within the uh, European research area. But then, as I said before, the Commission wants also to act, not only to preach. And uh, to walk the talk, uh, we uh, included uh, the uh, open science practices as uh, transver transversal conditions in uh, our research and innovation funding program, that is Horizon Europe. So we have seen an evolution in terms uh, along the different work programs, uh, including open access, as a pilot and then as a mandatory condition and now we don't see uh, not only open access but also open data and now we see those elements so open access the uh, uh, research data management uh, and uh, uh, the fair data principles implementations as conditions that also affect the evaluation of our proposal, of the proposals that the Commission uh, and the external expert that the Commission uses uh, to, um, to, 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 to judge, to um, rank the proposals and to see in which way they are implementing uh, this kind of uh, uh, conditions. There are also uh, possibilities in different work programs to enhance these conditions and even to, uh, let's say, uh, impose, strong word, but let's say to, to request uh, the, the data to be deposited in certified repositories and to have uh, notably federated in EOSC uh, if, uh, if such thing can, uh, can happen, can be. Uh, and, and uh, or, or let's say an announced uh, uh, framework of conditions towards uh, uh, digital outputs. So uh, I, I bring all the, the points because it's no need to 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 go through uh, one by one. Uh, one element uh, it's, uh, that uh, really need, needs to change is the, the scholarly communication that uh, need to be fit for this uh, uh, digital transformation of research. So what's, uh, uh, the, I mean, we all know what are the problems that uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, the dominance of, uh, of um, high impact factor journals, that uh, uh, there are uh, uh, outputs, uh, uh, publications locked uh, behind paywalls, and uh, uh, there are limitations of uh, um, access to, uh, to free access to the research knowledge. So what we, uh, we, we consider 
a change uh, in scholarly communication is the immediate open access uh, to, to research outputs. The uh, research uh, authors, uh, the research actors that uh, need to take the full ownership of their scientific results, not be, uh, let's say, dominated by uh, publishers or uh, uh, other predat predatory actors in, uh, in the current systems. And uh, uh, we need also to uh, introduce a differentiation in publishing because uh, not only uh, articles are, have to be considered, let's say, research outputs to be uh, part of uh, a uh, research production of, of, uh, of researchers and should be, of course, affordable, sustainable and equitable. Uh, within uh, within the research system. So uh, to do to do so uh, now we we heard about uh, uh, a, let's say a push towards the um, diamond open access uh, that brings uh, no uh, article processing charges to publish in uh, in open access venue, uh, open access venues. And one example that the Commission wants to bring on the table is the Open Research Europe platform. is a publishing venue uh, that the Commission offers to its beneficiaries uh, at no cost, and uh, it's uh, let's say a step towards. Uh, a, a new way of uh, handling um, scholarly communication. I'd say that, uh, sorry, there are two slides here because uh, the, uh, the numbers uh, have changed a bit. So the, this uh, Open Research uh, Europe uh, uh, publishing platform is gaining traction and uh, we see more and more increase uh, an increase of uh, uh, researchers funded uh, under uh, horizon 2020 and horizon europe wanting to publish in this platform so here uh, okay you see a nice um, a nice uh, uh, let's say, ensemble of pictures uh, that uh, uh, is, uh, is to show in a marketable way, I mean, the advantages of having a, a publishing platform that uh, is, uh, uh, let's say, uh, that proposes an immediate uh, publication and a post-publication uh, peer review. That is a new method that uh, we introduced with, uh, within uh, Open Research Europe. Uh, of course, uh, we don't publish everything because it, of its immediate publication. I mean, there are editorial, uh, there is an editorial work, there are editorial analysis, and uh, we don't publish rubbish. I mean, we publish uh, scientific articles that later on will be reviewed in, uh, in short time, and also the peer reviews are part of the scientific uh, production of the scientific knowledge. Two minutes, okay. So uh, we want to go beyond with this investment, and uh, the uh, Open Research Europe uh, has uh, the aim of becoming a, a research, a, a publishing uh, venue. Uh, for the um, European research area. We want to include new funders and we want to make it bigger in a plan that sees an evolution after uh, 2026. Uh, and uh, we want to go also uh, full open, uh, open source software uh, with a new platform that can be also replicated by many others. So, including uh, the last point of uh, uh, the open science uh, framework of actions of the Commission is to promote uh, citizen and societal engagement. Of course, new data from citizens, new contribution, uh, more exposures, um, exposures to, res uh, to research results from the side of the citizen can only increase the trust in, uh, in science.
And uh, yes, we are running also a mutual learning exercise with, uh, promoted by member states on citizen science that just to, uh, let's say, uh, see that there are also elements in science that are not from only from the lab. So what uh, open science uh, should be next? So uh, there is the overarching challenge of a cultural shift. Uh, of a cultural shift. I mean, we want uh, EOSC to deliver its promise, and also we want assessment of research uh, uh, that uh, should be will be reformed. Uh, and uh, uh, there are, as I said, institutional national. Uh, and uh, um, European uh, actions that need to take place to do so. But uh, going back to uh, the, the, the enablers, I want to conclude uh, stressing out that EOSC and the digital infrastructure for open science are not only there to, to bring these new tools to researchers, uh, but also to contribute to, to, to the other aspects of this uh, uh, complex uh, set of priorities in the, in the open science policy. For example, they can contribute to the culture of uh, open data and uh, the fair data principles. They can provide the means of, and the information to create a, a, a new generation matrix that is fundamental for uh, uh, reforming the research assessment. They can also federate and uh, better link data and publications within the scholarly communication. They, uh, they can push through collaboration tools for uh, uh, the implementation of uh, 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 integrity principles within the research process. They can bring more knowledge and uh, support this need of, uh, of skills uh, required by the digital transformation of science. And ultimately, they can open up to citizen engagement uh, and even actions of citizen science. So uh, EOSC and the digital infrastructure such as EGI are a key role not only in bringing tools, but also in uh, uh, helping the, the real implementation of a much, much big, bigger and systemic change that uh, we need uh, for, uh, in Europe and globally. And with this, I conclude. Thank you. Let's, let's take one question. And I already see a hand. Thanks. So, sorry for monopolizing the, the microphone. Uh, Yannick Legray, OPERAS, the mm -hmm. Open Scholarly uh, Communication Research Infrastructure, and one of the two uh, research infrastructure mentioned next to uh, Open Research Europe in the, the conclusion of the uh, European Council on, Com on Competitiveness. So thank you very much for your talk. Um, one of my questions is how can we collaborate uh, with you and uh, with Open Research Europe to, to maximize the impact we, we all expect to have on, on promoting open science and open scholarly communication? Well, uh, looking towards, uh, uh, let's say, this uh, uh, transformation of Open Research Europe uh, uh, in, into a uh, multi-funder or even fully open uh, publishing venue, uh, we need to talk to funders, we need to talk also to projects like Operas and, uh, and, 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 and others, uh, to uh, engage and to establish what are the rules uh, behind these kind of initiatives. I mean, uh, how it can be set up. I mean, if there is a legal entity behind, how it can be funded. Uh, and uh, uh, seeing how much of the uh, Diamond Open Access uh, theory we can put in practice. And uh, we are very happy to, to establish on that level a dialogue uh, 
uh, with uh, with you, and uh, I know that you are already in contact with uh, uh, my colleagues in the Open Access team, not, notably Victoria Zucala and uh, Jean-François Deschamps. So uh, let's leverage on that. Let's bring uh, all the actors on the table uh, to see uh, in which way we can set a governance for the new research. Um, open Research Europe platform and uh, also to showcase and create the, uh, let's say, a framework that can be uh, replicated uh, uh, in, uh, in other contexts, uh, at the institutional level or uh, uh, at the national level, or let's say uh, investing more and more on the Research Europe uh, of the future, Open Research Europe of the future. Thank you. And with this one, I would like to thank you for the speakers, for the excellent talks, for the good questions. And let's move to the next part of this session. Now it becomes a parallel session, so you have two choices at least. One is to stay here in this room. We will have a session with my colleagues focusing on the EJA's flagship project of EGI and the achievements uh, up to this point. The other parallel session is a set of demonstrations which happen somewhere nearby. You can check in the VUVA app, or of course you can enjoy side meetings in the cafe lounge. So thank you very much. If you decide to stay, which I hope you, most of you do, then please, can we, we can even move closer to the, to the middle so we can have a smaller space. Let's, let's wait a few minutes so people can decide where to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. I didn't know that there were the screens. Yeah, actually, it would, would have been better for me to sit there. Yeah. I thought that yeah. I could face Sorry. this one.
And it's a, it's, it's a flagship because it covers the entirety of the Federation members. We have all the member states from the EGI Council involved in different uh, position or different power. And it covers also the entirety of the services that we deliver. The services that we deliver for researchers, for communities, for long tail of science, for teams and projects. The services we deliver to keep the Federation going. And also services that we offer for business entities. The scope of the project, it's a Horizon, uh, Europe, Horizon 2020 project, but the focus is very much on service delivery. Okay, so there is very little research and development and integration activities. The focus is on make production scale services delivered through the European Open Science Cloud for advanced computing. Besides that service delivery, or as part of that service delivery, we do quite a lot of service integration, which is basically application and data integration into the, into the services from research entities and research infrastructures, more notably, who are fundamentally producers of research data and producers of research models or scientific models for the uh, digital calculations and predictions. The project started on the 1st of January 21. Uh, runs for two and a half years. Now we are just over the half, half time of this project. I talked about the service aspect, and, and that's really in the heart of the project. And the service delivery happens in, in this kind of layered architecture, or can be best represented in this layered architecture, where we have the bottom layer, the infrastructure services. So this is really the, 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 heavy, the heavy weight uh, of the project with uh, over 13 research clouds and public clouds from two uh, commercial entities, high throughput compute services, and a uh, new stream of, of high performance computing services delivered by the EGI members. On top of these delivery or infrastructure layers, we have a platform layer that fundamentally starts with an in, uh, interoperability for uh, application portability or application portability portability capabilities. It has single sign-on across the federated sites and it has data portability capability. So this layer really ensures that we can move workloads around, we can move identities, so users around, and we can move scientific data sets around. So this is really what, what makes the, uh, the layer homogeneous for the upper platforms and applications. And in this upper, upper side platforms, there are different environments all tuned for specific type of workloads from interactive computing with notebooks, for example, to scalable deployment of clusters, AI model training, and delivery of massively parallel applications. And on top of that, we serve different disciplinary areas, both from large research infrastructures to the long tail of science. And an important aspect of the project is the business model. And I think that's, I would say that's one of the most important innovations in the project, is how we deliver the services in such a way that they are not just there for two and a half years, but they continue to serve communities beyond the project lifetime. And we do this by fundamentally delivering the services or make the services accessible through two channels. One is the EOS portal through which we cataloged already 35 services, so they are accessible for the user, they can request access. Depending on the access policy of that particular service, they may just access them, kind of just logging in and up you go, or they may need an evaluation step by the service owner to, to decide about eligibility of access. The other route we put in is a call for use cases or call for projects or user projects which is an online form that's available continuously, and we evaluate the received re request every two months. And the benefit of this second model is that many of the users or user projects don't know exactly which of the 35 services are applicable for their use case. So they just describe what they want to achieve, and we translate their description into actual service instances, and we bring in the right experts. So the user support is much more intense and much more integrated for those who go in through the second route. And the business model behind that is that we try to use resources 
that are already prepaid by local funding agencies and institutes and are delivering capabilities for that type of research domain or for the type of project that applied for access. So an example, if a community comes in with a three-year-long project for requesting compute clouds for bioinformatics research, we identify those providers from our network who are already nationally or institutionally missioned to support bioinformatics research and try to get them on board first. And if we fail to find them or we don't find the right expertise or the right scale of such research uh, providers, then we use the so-called virtual access funding, which is a funding in the project given to providers to deliver resources. And then some of the uh, small subset of customers come with their own funding, so that's another route, that they pay for their access and then we are, uh, again, more flexible. But this way, we try to rely on local funds that's already available and the project actually pays for this brokering mechanism more and the onboarding mechanism instead of the actual continuous delivery. And in this way, we connect users and user projects with providers who are already missioned to work in the long term for that discipline or for that region or for that kind of project. Therefore, we build long-term sustainable structures. <coughs> and th this process is quite successful, not just because the cloud computing CPU, our usage is going up. It didn't start with EGIS. It started before EGIS. We had another EOSC-related project, EOSC Hub. But it clearly shows that the demand for this kind of cloud computing capability is there. And through this support layer that I briefly explained, we generated interest in the services and this is just keep going up. And an important bit, coming back to this breakdown of funding, is that more than half of the delivered capacity are actually not using the virtual access mechanism. It's using capacities and funding that's available at the national infrastructures that are on board in EGI. So that's a huge plus and a value for everyone, not just the commission, but also for the users and providers. So with that one, I would like to hand over to Giuseppe to talk a bit more about who these users are, how we engage with them, and what they demanded the most. Thank you, Kerke. Okay. So, so I will uh, briefly update you about the status of the achievement. So what we have achieved after 21st uh, months. Um, so um, one of the goals of the project was to increase the user base. So try to identify additional uh, community, scientists, uh, or, and also research infrastructure which can contribute to the EOSC. So what we have done, as was mentioned before, was to set up this open call to select the additional use case, but also Another channel, important channel for us was the EOSC uh, marketplace. So we received the service order of user, basically long tail of science user that are interested to integrate a run application on our infrastructure. So what you see here is the uh, supporting pipelines that we set up in the framework of the project. So we started with the assessment phase, so try to understand the technical requirement collected. So uh, we, if this process is successful, we associate uh, uh, a technical expert with, that will work together with the principal investigator, try to uh, integrate uh, uh, in services in order to support the, um, the use case. So uh, everything, all the activity integration plan are coordinated and done in the context of this, what we shall call competence center. It's a sort of a, a mini project which, allow, which involves not only the principal investigator, the shepherd, but also the service and the resource provider. So in the framework of this uh, uh, competence center, we monitor the activities. Uh, and if uh, in the end uh, everything is uh, successful, we uh, register new services uh, in, in the EOSC. So up to now, as I said before, after 21st uh, months of the project, we uh, received in total uh, more, almost 150 requests, including a use case and the service order. You see here the breakdown. So 40 applications were selected with the open call uh, in uh, uh, nine different uh, uh, cutoff date and uh, uh, more than 100 uh, service order received. So if you want to get more information about the 
um, who submitted this kind of request. So some of them are coming from an H2020 project and also research infrastructure, but also long tail of science. We did a, a marketing campaign at the beginning of the project. So we tried to promote this open science uh, with this open call. And uh, thanks to this promotion, we received a lot of uh, input from uh, H2020 project and many, many others. And we have also uh, received and uh, supporting also some SME as well. Uh, if you are looking about, if you are interested to understand uh, uh, the, the, the most demanded services requested, you see here uh, that uh, uh, some of them, most of them are coming from uh, research infrastructure. So all of them are mostly requesting a cloud storage capacity, uh, integrate them with uh, our uh, check-in services. So what we, le the lessons learned from this uh, exercise, let's say, is that uh, there is uh, a lot of requests from uh, IT services. Uh, we are a bit, a bit disappointed about the uh, requests uh, coming for requesting uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. There are not a lot. And another important uh, information uh, that, it, that we, uh, important for us is that the technical support that we put in place is uh, playing an important role in order to achieve everything. So, uh, some statistics, oops, there's some animation here. Okay, this is my final takeaway message. So um, up to now, we are, uh, through the open call, we are supporting more than 1,000 of uh, user. But this is uh, underrated because uh, um, these are coming from basically from the customer interview that we did. So a lot of information are still missing. Uh, these are uh, coming from 13 different countries. 